I don't know how many times I've seen some variation of the question, hey, I'm brand new to all of this, I want to get started in astrophotography, what gear should I buy? And as much as I hate making blanket recommendations about that kind of stuff, in this video I want to talk about a very specific and reasonable beginner setup and why I and others recommend each part of it. Welcome to Alaskan Astro. I think astrophotography should be fun and enjoyable, not a headache. And this combination of gear that I'm going to show you should help you get there as a beginner, or as somebody who is deep into the headache side of this hobby and just wants a break, or a nice travel rig. I think the Skywatcher Star Adventurer, the Rokinon 135mm F2, and whatever DSLR you have access to make the ultimate beginner setup. I've asked some people to send in example pictures that they've taken with rigs really similar to this, and I think the results speak for themselves. So let me walk you through each component of this and specifically why we recommend it. This lens, the manual focus Rokinon 135mm F2, defies the usual rules of consumer gear. It's pretty lightweight and compact. At F2, it's crazy fast. And even with the aperture wide open, it's tack sharp out to the corners. And with all that, it somehow still manages to stay reasonably affordable. The relatively wide 135mm focal length actually looks great on a surprising number of deep sky objects. Contrary to what a lot of beginners think, many deep sky objects actually aren't that small and don't need a huge amount of magnification, they're just dim and need a lot of exposure time. With the Milky Way rising sooner and sooner as we get into summer, this is a perfect time to get to play around with sweeping vistas of dust or framing up multiple nebula targets. In addition to just having some really cool framing options at this focal length, it also means that it's not very demanding on your tracker, so you don't need to get your polar alignment perfectly precise and it also means it's pretty easy to find and frame up your targets. With its fast f2 focal ratio, this lens is an absolute light bucket, and that's helpful for a couple reasons. It means you're letting in as much space light as quickly as possible, which means that you're either going to get a finished product quickly, or if you want to dump a ton of time into a faint object, you'll get an incredible result. It also means that any of your test shots as you're framing up your target can be pretty quick, which makes framing a lot easier and it makes it super practical to use live view function with a Batonov mask to get your focus just right. Now this is something that I really appreciate about this setup. Because of the high speed of this lens and its relative wide angle, you really don't need to worry about figuring out auto guiding with this. Now that's huge for portability, convenience, and ease of learning for somebody who's new to all of this. Basically the lens is fast enough that you're not going to be taking that long of exposures, and even if you do, its relative wide angle gives you a large pixel scale so that any errors in the tracking of the mount are going to be pretty hard to notice in your finished image. If you want satisfying deep sky astrophotography images, you need a star tracker. At their basic function, they all do the same thing. They just slowly rotate throughout the night at the same speed and direction that the stars appear to move through the sky. This lets you take long exposures without the stars trailing and lets you stack multiple images together to get your final image. There's a couple good star trackers out on the market, but let me talk specifically about why I recommend the Skywatcher Star Adventure, or the Swissa as it's sometimes called. It, really, it's just good at what it does. It's pretty lightweight and portable, it tracks pretty accurately, and because it's got a decent payload, a little setup like this isn't pushing it to its limits. There's also a couple standout features that I think separate it from the competition. One of them is the declination bracket. This little geared head on here lets you finely adjust and frame your targets, which is a huge quality of life increase over having to just loosen a clutch and then hope that you lock it in the right place. It's fine and precise. Something that I really appreciate about the Swissa is the fact that it uses regular AA batteries. Some people are big into wanting rechargeables, just get some rechargeable AA batteries. For something that you're going to be traveling with, I think it's invaluable to be able to carry some spares with you, or in an emergency, run to a gas station and pick up something that's easily available. The Swissa has a built-in polar scope, 
with a really good reticle with markings for the north and southern hemisphere that make it pretty easy to polar align long before it's dark enough to start shooting. You will need a tripod, and while pretty much anything you have is going to work, the Star Adventurer tripod gets you a lot of stability and features without a lot of fluff. Psst. Hey, I want to tell you a secret. Astrophotography is a pretty niche hobby, and unless you're part of some research project grant thing, the sensors and even the most advanced astrophotography cameras are usually just extras off the same production line of the sensors that go in a regular DSLR. Now there's obviously advantages to a dedicated astrophotography camera, but that's a subject for another video. Back to my main point, pretty much any modern-ish DSLR or mirrorless camera is going to be more than good enough to get you started in astrophotography. I actually don't have a specific model recommendation in this video. If you have a DSLR that you use for daytime photography, it's probably going to work just fine for astrophotography too. If you are looking for a camera, here's some things to look for and some things that you really don't need to worry about. Things to look for. Pretty much any semi-modern camera will do. For example, the Canon T3i was released more than 10 years ago, and it's still an alright camera for astrophotography. The used market is your friend here. Craigslist, eBay. A flip-out screen with live view. This is a big quality of life bonus for framing and focusing, because this is pretty awful. You'll want a port for an intervalometer to control your shutter automatically so you can let the rig run on its own and you won't shake anything. And some features you don't need to worry about. Any kind of fancy autofocus, guess what, you are the autofocus now. And that's fine, this lens is pretty easy to focus and it holds really well throughout the night. Unless you've got some extreme temperature shifts, maybe just check it once or twice through the night. Uh, any kind of in-body image stabilization you don't need to worry about, it's just going to confuse things. Turn it off if you have it. And any kind of high frame rate action settings, you're going to be taking maybe one picture every 30 seconds. Other than that, again, pretty much any semi-modern DSLR is going to be plenty to get you going in astrophotography. If you see yourself advancing in this hobby, Nikon and Canon tend to have the most widespread support in astrophotography software. But if you see yourself advancing, maybe you see yourself getting a dedicated AP cam and that won't really matter as much. I wanted to make a blanket recommendation of a specific model for this video, but they kind of all have their issues. The Canon T3i and other Canons have some banding issues in the sensor. The Nikon D5300 is a really great little camera, uh, but it can have some weird rainbow effects that show up when you stack unless you're using PixInsight. And Sony makes some really great cameras, but they have that limited software support if you see yourself advancing. But again, if you're just using a little setup like this, a lot of that doesn't really matter that much. Alright, let's talk about some accessories, some caveats to this setup, and what this is all going to run you. Because there's no way around it, this is going to cost some money. Also, bear with me, I got a bit of a head cold in the last few days, which I'm actually alright with, because hey, welcome back to the real world immune system. Uh, but yeah, so probably one of the first things is an intervalometer. This is just an external control for your camera's shutter that lets you take many long exposures automatically through the night. Depending on your climate, I think a USB powered dew heater band is pretty much essential. Uh, this can be the difference between a successful night and all of your images being ruined after an hour from dew forming on your lens. I like having a big USB power bank. You can power your dew heater and the next item, a dummy battery for your camera. This replaces the regular battery that goes into your camera and you can get these in either a USB or an AC powered version and it's great to not have to worry about your camera's battery dying, especially on those cold winter nights when DSLR batteries sometimes just don't last that long. A Batonov mask. Remember, this is manual focus. Batonov mask helps you out by creating a diffraction pattern on bright stars. Basically, you just adjust your focus ring until the middle spike lines up. It's fast, precise, and easy. Uh, you can kit these on Amazon, or have a friend 3D print you one, or even just cut them out of cardboard or plastic and it'll probably work for you. A red dot sight that goes on top of your camera can help make finding your targets a little bit easier. Remember, this is all manual, there's no go-to, so you need to be able to star hop and find what you're actually trying to take pictures of. One limitation with this setup is camera framing and rotation. You need something else to be able to adjust the rotation with this setup. 
While you could use a sturdy ball head, that's introducing one potential area of flex on here. Uh, best is to get some sort of a lens collar. Apparently the William Optics Red Cat collar fits perfectly on this lens, so I guess that's what I'd recommend. I'm going to try to keep this brief because this can open up a whole can of worms, but let's quickly talk about light pollution, modding your camera, and filters. As with any and all astrophotography, the darker your skies are, the better your results are going to be. This setup is especially well suited to shooting broadband objects under really dark skies. Modding your camera involves removing the built-in UV IR cut filter and replacing it with a piece of glass that's a lot more permissive on the red end of the spectrum. This makes your camera a lot more sensitive to the hydrogen alpha emission line, which is all that nice pink and red space glow that you see. There are services that can do this for you for the camera, but if you're feeling adventurous, there's also a lot of really good guides online to do it yourself. I've done it myself, and while it was a little nerve wracking, it worked out pretty well. Okay, filters. Filters only work on emission nebula. Because the moon and modern light pollution is so broadband, only narrow duo band filters are really worth your time on a setup like this. Now, they really can help, especially if you have a modded camera. Those duo band filters let in the oxygen 3 and the hydrogen alpha emission lines, and you can do some really cool images with that. But they don't help on galaxies, they don't help on dust, they only help on emission nebula. And that's all I'm going to say about that in this video. So what is all of this going to end up running you? Well, if you had to buy everything brand new, it's going to be about $1,600 or $1,700. And I admit, that's a lot of money. But there's no reason that you can't get any of these components used. And especially with the DSLR, since it doesn't have to be that new or nice, you can save a lot of money going the used route. If you find the right deals, I think you should be able to get that total cut nearly in half. After all that, I just want to reiterate how much I enjoy this little setup. Here's a shot I got a couple weeks ago with just one night of data on this exact rig. And you know, as you advance through the hobby, there's no reason you can't keep using this gear. I use this lens on my dedicated mono camera. There's no reason you can't put a DSLR on most telescopes. And it's so great having a portable little tracker like this. In fact, let me show you how quick and easy it is to set this thing up from the box. And that's all there is to it. This is ready to take outside. Once you're outside, there's not much more to do than get your tripod somewhat leveled, adjust your polar alignment, find a star to focus on, make sure your tracker is turned on, and then just find your target, frame it up, and start shooting. I hope you found this video helpful. If you've got questions or think I missed something, feel free to leave a comment below. I hope you leave this video with an understanding that a simple setup like this doesn't have to be a compromise, and you can still get some amazing deep sky astro photos with something just like this. Just remember to wear a coat, because apparently even in May, it still gets cold out there.